Thank you to everyone at Pilgrims for having me. Thank you for coming out tonight. Um, this is really cool. I love doing these. I've been with Hammer for 11 and a half years. I've been using their products for 20 years. But before we get started, I, I promise you this is not a hardcore sales pitch thing. This evening is about you. So even though the shirt says Hammer, the hat says Hammer, all the products says Hammer, and yes, I, I will be referring to Hammer a bit during the evening. Um, what I really want to do is just share knowledge uh, and not sell you anything. Edward's really good at that. I'm, I'm not. So uh, the lecture is, or the seminar is not entitled How to Get You to Buy All the Hammer Stuff in the World. It's called 15 Simple Ways to Improve Your Athletic Performance Right Now. These are things that we at Hammer Nutrition have observed from science for almost 25 years. We're celebrating our 25th anniversary next year. Uh, most of these things are things that I learned the hard way in my athletic career, which started in 1987 and culminated in 2002 uh, when I did uh, history's first and only double Furnace Creek 508, which is the Furnace Creek 508 route backward, sleep for a couple hours, then do the actual race as the second half of the record attempt. It went amazingly well, not even a flat tire. Um, and that's when that little voice in my ear said, quit while you're ahead. So after 18 years of ultra cycling, uh, that was the final thing. So um, a lot of these things I learned the hard way. And this is what we've observed with athletes over the last 24, 25 years. Um, you know, I'm smart enough to know that you're smart enough that we are all experiments of one and you may need to try a variety of products, a variety of protocols in order to find what works for you as the individual. But I do believe that the more of these 15 topics that we're going to talk about, I believe the more of these that you apply consistently in your training, the better your workouts will be, um, the more fueling will be less of a question mark and a guessing game and more of a strong point. It won't be your weak point, it'll be your strong point. I mean it's pretty easy to get the training dialed in after a little while. It's super easy to get the equipment dialed in. Fueling is can be very confusing. When I started in 1987 there was nothing in the way of endurance fuels or knowledge on how to properly fuel. When I did my first race across America in 1988 the advice I was given was you're going to be out there for at least 10 days. It was a 3,070 something mile race. Um, the guy I went to for advice, the most knowledgeable guy I knew said, well, Steve, you're going to be burning, you know, thousands of calories a day. I was riding an average of 21, 22 hours a day, two to three hours of sleep of a night. So he said, just eat, make your crew just force feed you. Even when you feel like you're going to puke, just continue to eat. You need those calories because you're burning a gazillion calories. You're going you're gonna to die by the time you get to Kansas. Um, and just drink. There was no guidelines on how much or how little. It was just drink, 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 drink. And, and the same thing with sodium. Well, Steve, you're going to be going through some hot temperatures in the first couple of days. Start just, just pop salt tablets, you know. Just have them salt everything. In fact, just take the salt shaker and just chug it down. I finished that race literally gaining weight, so much weight. I'm probably the only guy who's ridden uh, 3,000 miles in 10 and a half days um, that put on weight. Um, and no kidding, everything, every extremity, my hands, my feet, my belly, my face was bloated from the excess sodium causing water retention. In fact, I could, I could almost go down on the drops and my stomach was so distended it, would, it almost kind of draped over the top tube. So um, that was back then where, you know, endurance equated with misery. You know, it's just the way it goes. And, and it doesn't have to be that way. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. And what I'd like to do is, um, while all 15 of these topics deserve much more time than we have time for, um, I don't want to gloss over them, but we do need to go over them because they are really, really important. Um, 
And again, I think the more of these that you apply in your training um, consistently, the better your workouts, the better your races will be, the more fun you'll have, and you can make nutrition, uh, you can take the guesswork out of it. This is kind of, these two pages are kind of the, the Reader's Digest version of these two books, um, which along with the now retired head of our research and development and our company owner, I wrote, um, it's been 11 years. The first book was 26 pages long. Now there's two books. So this one basically talks about all of our uh, protocols, our beliefs, our position papers, so to speak, on how to fuel properly. And this book goes talks about our supplements and fuels in a little bo bit more detail. So um, with that in mind, let's get started. By the way, if you have questions, my voice does not tend to last long, so um, questions help me to just reel it in because I, like, I love to go off on tangents. If there is one thing that you can take away from tonight, it, just one thing only, it's this. The human body is so marvelously designed, it knows how to take care of itself. Athletes tend to overcompensate. They worry so much about bonking or dehydrating or cramping that they overcompensate, they consume too many calories, they drink too much fluids, they take in too much salt. And by doing so, they contravene or override all of these wonderful built-in survival mechanisms that are there to help us live one more day. So when we overcompensate, or as Dr. Meisner says, when we try to do help ourselves too much, we end up doing more harm than good. So we take the position of less is best. We want to fuel in cooperation with our body. We want to work with all of these wonderful built-in mechanisms uh, that are there to protect us. The body's first instinct is survival. And when you start a workout or a race, your body switches into survival mode. And all of these wonderful hormonal complex mechanisms just start kicking in. And the body is very capable of bridging the gap between what it's losing and what it can comfortably accept in return from you. So when you hear some of this information, it might sound a little odd because uh, there's, a, there's still a lot of coaches and coach organizations that tell you you need to replace X out with X or near X back in, and the body's simply not designed to do that. So let's go over a few of these things um, as far as fueling, and if you have any questions, by all means, interject. One by one. So, number one, keep fluid intake during exercise between 16 to 28 ounces per hour. You know, I think out of all the things that can happen with fueling, I mean, if you consume too many calories, you'll get sick, you'll throw up. If you consume too much sodium, your body will retain excess fluids. You just, dis you just disrupt all the hormonal mechanisms. If you drink too much, though, you can kill yourself, and people have done it. People have literally killed themselves by water intoxication. So uh, you do need to be careful with fluid intake. You definitely don't want to dehydrate, but you don't want to overhydrate either. Now, I don't know if, the, if their position has changed, but the American College of Sports Medicine, their current position paper, to my understanding, suggests that during exercise, a fluid intake of 20 to 40, almost 41 ounces per hour. 20 to 41 ounces per hour is ideal. And we looked at that and I thought, you know, that's like the weatherman saying, tomorrow it's gonna to be anywhere from 65 to 90. It's a huge gap. And it's really impossible not to be within that widespread. So we looked at all the science and we read all the research on, bless you, and again. We read all the research on hydration most of which was done by uh, Dr. Tim Noakes of South Africa, uh, Dr. Ian Harrison, who writes for uh, Triathlete Magazine, and Dr. Ian Rogers in, in Australia. They are the gurus of hydration, and they've done study after study with thousands and tens of thousands of athletes, and they came to this conclusion. You can prevent dehydration without flirting with all the issues of overhydration, by keeping your fluid intake between 16 and 28 ounces per hour. I'm gonna whittle that down just a little bit more. It's about a 20 ounce water bottle. It's about 25 ounces. 
here's a good starting point. Somewhere between here and here, plus or minus three or four ounces on either side, depending on your size, the weight, your, your body weight, the weather outside, how poorly or well you're acclimated to it. So someone your size, you're, you're very lightweight on a cool day, you probably won't even need this much. 16 to 18 ounces will be more than sufficient. When I was down at Auburn, Alabama last week, it was 104, 90 some percent humidity and a heat index of 118. I couldn't keep up with hydration. There was no way. So when I exercise, you either have to exercise when it's cooler or you just have to slow the heck down. But I needed a little bit more than 25 ounces. I bumped it up to thir uh, about 28 ounces. So this is just a good gauge to start with, fine-tuning that and tweaking it depending on your size, the weather outside, uh, you know, the terrain, how well or poorly you're acclimated to the weather. And not to deviate too much from this topic, but I'll give you a, a, just a little tip that I like. When I go for a long ride, this is my main fuel. Love this stuff, Perpetuum. I do not like to drink a bottle of it every hour though. I like my fuel as concentrated as possible. I, I, I just don't, I get tired of flavored anything after a while. So if I go out for say a four hour bike ride, I will make a seven or eight scoop bottle of Perpetuum. I'll start with a little water, add a couple of scoops, put the lid on, shake it up, and I'll repeat the process until I've got seven or eight scoops of, bottle, or of uh, the product in my bottle. Now I have four hours of fuel in one bottle. And a lot of triathletes do that. They'll, they'll make a four hour bottle of fuel, then they'll take a felt tip pen and mark it off in quarters that says, I only have to drink this much every hour. Now, there is fluid left over in the bottle, it's not sludge, and that fluid does count towards your overall fluid intake. But over the course of four hours, it's so inconsequential that in essence, this is a calories only bottle. So this is calories, and I'm gonna take care of my hydration needs with plain water from another source. I like this idea because number one, I don't have to drink so much volume of flavored liquid. Number two, I don't have to stop and make more because I've got four hours in my water bottle. Number three, if the weather gets hot and my ability to process calories goes down, but my fluid intake needs go up, I can increase my fluid intake without having to increase my calorie intake at the same time. So if you're doing a long ride or if you're doing a half Ironman, that's I think just the, a smart way of feeling because you're keeping your fluids and your calories coming in from sources independent of each other. So. You said that's going to be about 280 calories an hour. Mm -hmm. Drink one fourth of that. Wow. Yeah, we have on all of our products, and in that second book, this little one, we have suggested doses based on body weight. It's not written in stone, but it is a good starting point. Your mileage may vary. There's a lot of different flavors besides. Yeah, we've got. Uh, We've got three flavors and an unflavored version. Have melon? Uh, no, we don't on that one. We have a citrus flavor, uh, actually an orange vanilla. We have a strawberry vanilla, the cafe latte, and then a completely unflavored version, which you can flavor with heat or hammer gel. So, so that's hydration. Uh, number two, restrict calorie intake to 280 calories an hour or less during exercise. Um, you may be burning five, six, seven, eight hundred calories an hour. There's absolutely no way your body can accept anywhere near that amount from your fuel donation. Try and do that someday and watch what happens. Your stomach will rebel. You will be off the bike or out of your running shoes on the side of the road holding your stomach back. The body is simply not equipped to accept and replenishment an amount that comes anywhere near what it's losing. And it knows this. It knows, it knows that it can accept calories back in at a rate that it's depleting them. So everyone says, well, wait a minute. If you're saying I'm burning 800 calories an hour, and by and large, I've got to limit it to around 280 at the max, how come I don't die out here? You know, that's what happened to me in my first race across America. My coach was telling me to replace all the calories out with equal or near equal amounts, when what I should have done is realized we all have, I don't care how thin you are, 
we all have at least 40,000 calories, I'm probably closer to 100,000 calories, available from body fat stores. Once you hit hour number two and beyond, two thirds of your energy is gonna be fulfilled from body fat stores. That's one of your body's natural built-in survival mechanisms, which is why you don't need to replace what you lose in, in equal or near equal amounts. The human liver can kick back into the energy cycle roughly, oh, four to 4.6 calories per minute or roughly 240 to 280. And again, I don't mean to use you as an example all the time, but rarely will there be a day when you would need over 200 calories, ever. You're that light, 180, 200 might be fine. A guy like me, I've, I've gone up to 280, 300. When I did the double 508, I was on my bike for 75 and a half hours. I averaged slightly over 300 calories an hour. I was, burn, I was a fat burning machine. So the point is, is that four calories, 240 to 280 is for the average size athlete, meaning about 160, 165 pounds, that is the limit that the liver can kick back into the energy cycle. Now, if you're a lighter weight athlete, you can certainly get by on a lot less. And if you're a larger athlete, you might be able to get by on a lot more. But I believe that when it comes to calorie intake, the least amount of calories that you need to keep your body doing what you want it to do hour after hour after hour, that is the right way to fuel. Because if anything, if you screw up on the, hmm, not enough side, that's an easy problem to fix. I'll just take some more calories in. But if you overdo it, if you go, if you, if you err on the, uh-oh, I just downed like 500 calories. Now I can hear my stomach rumbling and, you know, there's a big climb coming up. Things aren't going to turn out well. Yeah, that's a lot harder hole to dig yourself out of. So to me, proper fueling, especially in regards to calories, is what's the least amount? I need to get my body to do what I want it to do hour after hour after hour. And when you look at our fueling recommendations, calorie-wise, they are ultra conservative. Why? Because we don't want you to get sick. And again, fixing a not enough problem is so much easier than a, uh-oh, too much problem. So start with 240 to 280 per hour as your guideline and fine tune that based on your body weight and the heat outside. When it's hot, my, my stomach doesn't want to digest anything. It, it needs to, you know, take, take in fewer calories. Um, number three, avoid simple sugars in your fuels. Use complex carbohydrates only. Um, if you are familiar with all of our fuels, we do not use anything that ends in OSE. That means there's no glucose, no sucrose, no fructose, no dextrose, no galactose. None of these one or two chain sugars. We call them simple sugars. Um, with the exception of fructose, which is the worst thing you can put in your body, and I don't mean fructose that's in the fruit, I mean just highly refined fructose. If you see anything with fructose in it, run away from it. It is the worst thing you can put in your body. Fructose barely elevates your blood sugar levels and then it drops them below fasting levels so you're worse off than when you started. It's, it's, it's horrible stuff for your body. It's a poor energy choice. And we believe that simple sugars like glucose or sucrose are too. Number one, they give, uh, they, they give your body a very short-term energy. And if you've ever done this, it's a bridge you really only want to cross once. You feel great for about 10 minutes after you swig that glucose or sucrose-based, you know, sugary.
and don't recommend uh, simple sugars like glucose or sucrose, anything that ends in OSE is. Number one, they give your body a very short-term energy supply. Peak crash, or as the triathletes call it, flash and crash. Um, the second reason is that in order for a simple sugar fuel to match your body fluid chemistry, the fancy term is osmolity, and be digested with any efficiency, it needs to be mixed extremely weak. I mean very calorically weak. So you don't get very many calories passing through the GI tract efficiently. I know a few athletes that say, well, I know I need, you know, 250 calories an hour. This glucose-based drink is 100 calories per scoop. I'll just make two and a half scoops. Well, now that concentration is too high. It, it, it's above the parameters of what body fluid chemistry is, and it literally sits in your stomach and starts fermenting until one of two things happen. You have to either drink more fluid to lower the chemical osmolity of that too concentrated sugar mix, at which point you're probably flirting with overhydration, or your body has to pull fluids and electrolytes away from the working muscles and divert them to the, to the stomach, to the digestive tract, just to again lower the chemical solution so that it can pass through the digestive tract efficiently. So the two inherent problems with simple sugars, they have a very, very short term energy supply and they have a very low ceiling in terms of how many calories your body can comfortably accept, digest and convert to energy. Maltodextrin is a five chain sugar, a five chain complex carbohydrate. We like using this for a couple of reasons. Number one, maltodextrin has the same glycemic index as pure glucose. So it will elevate your blood sugar levels as quickly as glucose will. That's desirable, highly desirable during and immediately after exercise. But unlike simple sugars, instead of going up and then straight down, it's a much longer lasting, very smooth energy. To use kind of a silly analogy, when you use simple sugars to fuel your body, it's like lighting a piece of paper on fire. Yeah, you get some heat, but it burns quick, hot, and it's out. Whereas complex carbs are kind of like put, putting kindling on the fire. It burns longer, more evenly, and smoother, and when the heat or energy does die down, it's very gradual. Two sex. Um, the second reason we like maltodextrin is because your body can accept and digest with complete efficiency, meaning no stomach distress, a greater volume of calories than it can from simple sugars. When you make a simple sugar drink, the, the most concentrated you can make it is about 60 to 80 calories or maybe about 80 to, or 6 to 8 percent or maybe about 80 to 100 calories. Maltodextrins, the complex carbs we use in our fuels, you can make at a concentration up to 18 percent you get that full 280 calories and it will pass through the GI tract as efficiently as normal body fluids, which means no stomach distress and you're giving your body the full amount of calories that it needs to convert to energy. So we highly recommend avoiding simple sugars in your fuel using complex carbs only. Question? I guess you're getting this multi-dextrin from these three things right here. Mm -hmm. It's derived from corn. Um, it's the same in here, in here, in here, and in here. All of our fuels. It's a corn-derived product. That's where they get sugar. There's no corn left in it by the time they get to the sugar. Same with vitamin C. Most vitamin C comes from corn, but by the time it's vitamin C in the bottle, there's no corn left in it. So it's just the, the complex sugar molecule from corn. Um, and it, it's just... Those have different percentages of... Yeah, obviously this is much more concentrated, so you're going to have to chase that with water, whereas this is a sports drink that you mix with water. Um, I prefer, I love this product, I think it's a great product, but again, I personally don't care for as much flavored liquid, so I take this, you know, in the flask, and now I've got five servings of hammer gel, and I'll just chase that with water. And again, how much you need on a per hour basis is, is dependent on your weight. Yeah, and, and, and in essence, both of these fuels, um, and this really ties in nicely to number four. Exercise in the two to three plus hour range requires protein too. 
you know, anything in the two, three hour range or under, either one of these, carbs only, will work just fine. If you like a sports drink, here you go. We've got one, two, three, five flavors of this. We've got nine flavors of this. The application for both of these is identical. So either or, these are all complex carbohydrates. Anything over three hours, and I think, you know, if I were doing like a three and a half hour marathon, I'd probably still go carbs only. Um, just because running is a digestively challenging type of event and I want the fuel that's going to digest the quickest, which is carbs. But um, when you get into longer workouts, three, four, five, six hour stuff, at least as your primary fuel, say two thirds to three quarters of the time, you need a fuel that has carbs and protein in it. And that's where one of these two fuels is. Sustained Energy we, we introduced in 1992 has no flavor, tastes like soy milk, because there's soy protein in there. Uh, we haven't changed it in almost 20 years. People still love this. I, grew, I started my whole career on this. Um, the double 508 was the final testing ground for Perpetuum. I used this as my primary fuel. The difference, very, very little. This has always been unflavored. It's bland. And some people say it tastes like wallpaper paste. I think it tastes like liquid Cheerios. Um, after you go out for, for a, a double century and you're out there fueling with sweet stuff for, you know, 10 hours, bland is, some, is, a, is a really, it's like an old friend, you know. You get the calories you need, but you're, you know, you're not having to deal with, you know, sweet stuff. Um, again, this we introduced in 1992. We haven't done a thing to it. We have a, a, a die-hard following of Sustain Energy users. Um, Perpetuum has the same carb to protein ratio, real close. It's about seven or eight parts carbohydrate to one part protein. Um, Perpetuum obviously has flavors. We have three flavors of Perpetuum and an unflavored version. But the two major differences are Perpetuum, we added a little bit of fat to it a little bit of healthy fat. The idea being that the longer you go, the more your body is going to access its body fat stores or more correctly, the calories from its body fat stores. When you give your body a little dose of fat, it says, thank you very much for not starving me of fat. I'll now let go of my fat stores more liberally so they can be used as an energy source more efficiently. We extrapolated that from the dieting craze from way back. Remember that? When, every, when, when the kick was cut out all the fat in your diet, and that's what everyone did. They cut out every gram of fat, and the body responded by saying, uh-uh, I'm holding on to what stores I've got. No fat coming in, no fat going out. So the longer you go and the more your body relies on the calories from its body fat stores, which again, the longer you go, two-thirds of your energy is going to come from the calories of stored body fat. So we have an almost endless supply of it. I mean, you could basically ride your bike from Coeur d'Alene down to Texas on body fat stores, literally. Uh, you do need some calories to keep the fire stoked, but you have a, a nearly unlimited supply of body fat stores, which again is why you don't need to replace calories out with the same or near same amounts of calories in. And it's nice to give your body a little dose of fat to just give it a cue that says, Here's a little fat. Now let go of those fat stores and let's use them as energy. The other thing we added to Perpetuum is a, a nutrient called sodium tribasic phosphate, um, which is probably the best acid buffering pH neutralizing agent there is. It's wonderful. That, that burning sensation, sodium phosphate just knocks it right out. It's wonderful stuff. I have made one observation completely. No science to back this up. I have found that the longer one goes, and especially the higher the body fat percentage, the better Perpetuum works. I know guys that can eat 4 million calories every day and not gain an ounce. I hate those guys. I find that this product tends to work better for them. That's just a hypothesis of mine that's been borne out with, a, with quite a few athletes. But the application for these is similar. Whenever you get into three plus hours, at least part of the time, say, and, and ideally two-thirds to three-quarters of the time, you need carbs and protein. Why? If you don't provide it in your fuel mix, your body still has to satisfy somewhere between 5 and 15 percent of its energy from protein. You know, once you hit hour number 203 and beyond, 
somewhere between 5 and 15 percent of your energy requirements are going to be fulfilled from protein. If you don't provide that in your fuel mix, your body will very gladly cannibalize or tear down your body, your, its own lean muscle tissue to make energy. Not a great idea. When your body literally digests it, its own muscle to make energy, number one, you can guarantee that your, your recovery after your workout is going to be a lot longer. Why? Because you've just broken down a lot more uh, uh, lean muscle tissue. Number two, when your body cannibalizes lean muscle tissue, it creates even more ammonia than it normally does. And I would argue that it is excess ammonia that is the primary cause of premature fatigue. Is that it, ketones? Mm -hmm. ketones? You bet. You can smell, I mean, you've seen it. You can smell it. You know, especially these guys that are the real lean, high metabolism guys. These are the guys that are probably burning 15% of their energy from protein. Man, they come in smelling like Mr. Clean. You know, whoa. But you can't avoid ammonia production completely, just like you can't avoid lactic acid production. But you can minimize it, and one of the, one of the best ways is when you get into these longer workouts or races, um, use a carb plus protein fuel. Now, some companies make a four to one ratio of carbs to protein. There's a very popular product, been around forever. I got no problem with that for recovery. Our recovery drink is three to one carbs to protein. But again, remember, only about five to 15% of your energy is gonna be fulfilled from protein. So you need a lot more cal or, or a lot more carbs than you do protein. You do need some protein, but the ratio should be skewed much more in favor of carbs. That's why these fuels are about a seven or eight to one ratio of carbs to protein, which we think is a better ratio for use during exercise. Um, number five, uh, we use soy protein in our during exercise fuels. We use whey protein isolate in our post exercise fuels. All things being equal, during exercise, soy protein is really high in certain amino acids that have antioxidant benefits, cardiovascular health benefits, pH buffering or pH neutralizing, acid buffering uh, benefits. You know, when you look at the amino acid profile of soy and whey protein together, soy is really high in certain amino acids that have benefits for during exercise. So that's why we selected it for use during exercise. So um, the other thing is most whey protein powders, and believe me, I do not believe there is anything better than whey protein for general health, immunity, muscle tissue repair, recovery. I mean, I'll go on record as saying that. That's the best protein source there is. But most, if not all companies, add an amino acid called glutamine to their whey protein products. Um, and, and I won't bore you with all the details, but glutamine is so beneficial you could write a book about it. Books have been written about it. It is more for recovery. See, glutamine has a little dark side to it. When you first ingest glutamine, it's not terribly stable. It produces a little ammonia when it's first metabolized. Now, during exercise, you're already producing ammonia. The last thing you want to do is exacerbate the problem. But that's what you do when you take glutamine supplements or glutamine-enhanced whey protein during exercise. Now, kind of interestingly and paradoxically, about three hours after you ingest glutamine, it it does produce ammonia initially, but about three hours down the road, it actually becomes a very effective ammonia scavenger. But during exercise, you don't have that luxury of waiting for three hours for glutamine to soak up its own ammonia and, and a little extra. So that's another reason why we recommend soy protein, because of the glutamine. After exercise, when the muscles are done you know, working, that little issue of excess ammonia is really a non-issue. And then all of the benefits of glutamine for the immune system, antioxidant support, glycogen synthesis, uh, gastrointestinal health, I mean, they can all be realized. So again, we think soy is the ideal protein for use during exercise with whey protein ideal for post-exercise. Um, let's see, six. <laughs> Use liquid fuels as your main energy source even during prolonged training and races. Um, 
going liquid only is an acquired skill. But when you're like me and don't have a whole lot of talent and you're going on training and, you know, I'll take all the help I can get. And I want a fuel that's going to digest quickly. I don't want my body to expend any energy digesting solid food. I don't have a problem with solid food, but I, think it's, I don't think it's a necessity. I think it's a luxury, even in an iron distance race. I've done 24 hour, hour races going liquid only. About hour 18, I wanted to put a gun into my head, but uh, what I was doing was I was giving my body a fuel that I knew provided exactly what I needed and in a form that took no effort from my body to digest. Now, if someone just is jonesing for some solid food, I don't have a problem with that. But I've seen enough athletes, and I, I hate to peg a certain type, but the adventure racer is really bad with this. They will eat so much solid food. And I learned this too the hard way. When you rely too heavily on solid food, it will make you lethargic if you eat it at night, like I did in one of my races. It's nighty night time because the body is pulling fluids and blood away from the working muscles just to help with the digestive process. You feel sluggish, and if you're, if you're pounding the solid food at two in the morning, like I've done in some of my ultras, man, it's just like, you know, I mean, what happens to us after lunch every day? I mean, don't you just want to crawl under the desk and just take a nap? That's because your body, I mean, it has to do with a lot of things, but your body is working so hard to process that solid food. All this being said, if you're going to eat solid food, I have two little rules. Number one, use it sparingly as a reward of sorts. You know, when my, my, uh, my wife, who has won the race across America twice, when, you know, we had to bribe her. Hey, when you get to this next town, there's a sandwich waiting for you. Oh, great, something to eat, you know. She didn't know it was a hammer gel and peanut butter sandwich, but... <laughs> Seriously, if you need something to eat, you make why you use it sparingly, you know, as a reward. Hey, when I get the special needs, out comes a hammer bar, you know, or whatever. You know, I'm gonna have that bagel or something. And number two, you make wise choices, which means lower devoid of refined sugar, lower devoid of saturated fat. I mean that stuff will be there for three days going through the digestive process. You might want to keep it, you know, semi-low in fiber, just especially if you're doing a half Ironman. You eat that bran muffin halfway through the bike, I promise you, you're going to have a bathroom break sometime during the run. So I, I don't want to take a very, but this is a great story. I have to tell it. Um, has anyone done El Tour de Tucson? It's like a hundred and, what is it, like 112 miles? I mean, it's a massive race down in Tucson, Arizona, late November. Like thousands of people do it. You got to kind of camp out overnight if you really want to get a space. Of course, they let all the elites up front and everyone's happy there. And um, so I managed to get myself in a good position. I was like 2,000th in line. And about 30 miles into this race, there's a dry riverbed crossing for about half a mile. And if you're not in the front of the pack, this thing's a dust bowl by the time you get there. It's hike a bike time. And I flatted right before this riverbed crossing, and a couple hundred guys passed me. I, uh, race is over, you know, now I'm just going to ride. I kid you not, I grab my bike, hike a bike, get up to the, you got to kind of crawl up this little hill. Honest to God, at the top of the hill, back when we got to the concrete, there was a Krispy Kreme stand. <laughs> it was the Krispy Kreme aid station. And I, and I stood there for 10 minutes watching people just rifle these things down. And I thought, man, they're going down good now, but man, it is going to, you're, it's going to get ugly later on. So, um, yeah, you know. And again, number one, that wasn't a wise choice to make. But number two, some of these guys were like, hey, I've just, I've just downed 3,000 calories. I'm good to go for the rest of the race. Body doesn't work like that. We don't have a gas tank. We've got to keep feeding the fire gradually. So, you know, you just can't, and this is true with water too. We're not camels. You know, we have to keep the fuel coming in consistently. So that's my little story about solid foods. Use it sparingly, make wise choices, you're good to go. Um, seven and eight require a lot of time, which we don't have. I'm just going to tie them in together. 
Um, electrolyte replenishment is as important as calories and fluids. It's probably the most confusing, misunderstood, and botched up subject on the topic of fueling, which ties into number eight. Don't rely on salt tablets to fill electrolyte requirements. I am not discounting the, the necessity of sodium. What I am saying is that if sodium were the only you know, card in the game, we could just take salt tablets and we'd be good to go. But all of the electrolytic minerals work together synergistically. So we're talking sodium, chloride, calcium, magnesium, potassium. There's some other cofactors that work with minerals like manganese, vitamin B6. But salt alone just doesn't cut it. You need all of the electrolytic minerals working together to maintain the optimal performance of a lot of important bodily functions. The reason why you take an electrolyte supplement is not so much to prevent bad things like cramping from happening. Of course you don't want cramping to happen. But the real reason why you take an electrolyte supplement or why you replenish electrolytes during exercise is because a lot of important bodily functions, their optimal performance, at least to some degree, is dependent on having adequate supplies of these electrolytic minerals. I mean, your cardiovascular system, your digestive system, uh, your central nervous system, and obviously your muscular system. Their optimal performance is dependent, at least to some degree, on having a regular supply of all of the electrolytic minerals. Now, a little word about sodium. Um, the average sedentary human being needs about 500 milligrams of sodium per day to maintain optimal health. Athletes probably need about four or five times that much. Do you know that every man, woman, and child in America, and I'm starting at age number two, is consuming about 8,000 milligrams of sodium? That's just sodium, that's not salt. That's just the sodium component of salt. Sodium, salt is, what, 40% sodium, 60% chloride. So if you do the math, and the whole population from age two to age whatever is consuming six to 8,000 milligrams of sodium, you can tell we're salting ourselves to death. And, and the USDA recommends an intake of less than 2,400 milligrams. Um, the American Heart Association last year lowered that and said you would see significantly less death from cardiovascular disease if everyone aimed for closer to 1,500. Um, there's another article coming out in our next issue of our magazine, Endurance News, and you can find the study online. It's profound. They found, and uh, this is a long-term, huge study involving thousands of people over a long period of time. They found, researchers found, that when people lowered their sodium intake and increased their potassium intake from the diet, there were less deaths from all causes. I mean, that's profound. Not just cardiovascular disease, but from all causes. Cancers, you know, you name it. Simply by balancing our dietary sodium. So the message is that sodium is an important mineral, but we consume far too much of it, and our body is very adept at storing it. When you start your workout or race, you will start with a minimum of 8,000 milligrams of sodium on board. Yes, during the first part of your workout or race, you're gonna lose a lot of sodium, maybe up to two or three grams. But fortunately, the body has a survival mechanism built in that understands this. And it involves a hormone called aldosterone. Aldosterone's basic function is to, mod, is to monitor sodium levels in the blood, and when it senses that the losses from sodium, from perspiration, sweat, whatever, urination, are becoming too great through a very complex set of mechanisms, it recirculates its stores of sodium back into the bloodstream via the kidneys. Now, it can't do this forever, obviously. It's gonna need some sodium in replenishment. But your body has, the point is, is that your body recognizes that it's losing sodium. And it has a built-in mechanism that helps monitor, recirculate, and thus conserve its sodium stores. You wanna screw that up? Here's how you do it. Overdo it on the sodium. Do a sweat test. Until the guy who does the sweat test says, oh, 
We just measured your sweat after running on a treadmill for an hour in this hot room with no circulation and you've lost four grams of sodium. That must mean you're going to lose four grams every hour during a half Ironman. Uh-uh. I mean, you put a guy on a stationary bike or a treadmill for an hour in a hot room with no ventilation, you collect his sweat, and you're going to see a lot of sodium. But that does not mean whatsoever that those losses are going to continue at the same rate hour after hour. The body's much smarter than that. And again, what works in the lab for an hour does not necessarily reflect what's going to happen out on the road when you have that cooling evaporative mechanism working for you. Aldosterone will take care of you. It will recirculate your stores of sodium. What happens when athletes take in too much sodium, and again, this is what happened to me in my first race across America. I mean, I was pounding the salt tablets. We were salting everything, you know. I, I had McDonald's fries, you know, I admit it. You know, there was my, enough sodium for a week. Uh, what happens when you take in too much sodium, and it's going to be different for everyone, and again, different conditions require different amounts. Uh, when you take in too much sodium, you turn the switch off on aldosterone, and it just says, I'm going away now. You just, you know, nighty night time. Another hormone called vasopressin, the antidiuretic hormone, kicks in and that causes the body to retain fluids. It forces the body to excrete more sodium out of perspiration, so you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot by taking in excess amounts of sodium, and you're also causing another hormone uh, to predominate that will cause your body to retain fluids. So just like I did in my first race across America, if you have ever seen or have experienced yourself finishing a long workout or a race, where everything is puffed up. Your f fingers down to your wrist, your face, cheeks, your ankles, your feet, chances are you overdid it on the sodium. Sodium alone does not work. Too much sodium is as, ba is as bad as not enough. You will really screw things up by too much sodium. So how much is enough? Well, it's different for everybody. I wish I could give you a one size all fits, you know, one size fits all amount. But there are so many variables that come into place. Mainly your body size, your body mass index, the weather outside, how well or poorly you're acclimated to it, your fitness level. Did you know that the fitter you become, you get about 50% more efficient at conserving your sodium stores? You get way better at burning fat. So early season, you'll probably lose more sodium than you will You know during uh, mid-season peak fitness. You know, what I need at 8 o'clock in the morning when it's cool is a heck of a lot lower than what I need at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So all of these variables, plus biological predisposition. I mean, I, I know some people who are just heavy sweaters. They lose a lot of sweat no matter what they do. They will cramp unless they're taking adequate amounts of all the minerals. But in general, for most people, most of the time, in a nice mix, uh, a full spectrum of all the electrolytic minerals, we believe 100 to 600 milligrams of sodium per hour, along with all the other minerals, works really nicely. That's one to six capsules of this. That's one to three tablets of our new product, which is an effervescent tablet form of this. Either one of those will serve you very well. Yes, Edward. Um, when I do some rice, sometimes I put the fizz right in my water bottles and mm -hmm. take that along and, and kind of use a little less on the Duralites. Is that the correct way to use that? Sure. Yeah. Both of these, there, there's, a, there's a, an article I wrote about the differences between the two. They're very similar, but in order to get this thing to dissolve in water, we had to use different forms of some of the minerals. We had to use sodium bicarbonate. This is sodium chloride. We had to get our chloride from another form. So there's a little more sodium in this just by design and just by necessity. That fizz stuff give you an upset stomach? No. Shouldn't. Mm -hmm. I mean, we use a natural sweetener in there. There's no, um, some companies use polyethylene glycol, which if you're making antifreeze, that's your, that's your ticket right there. Um, but they use in the manufacturing lubricating process, they use polyethylene glycol. Um, we use wheat germ oil, which by the way, even though wheat is in the name, it's gluten-free. 
it has less than three parts per million of gluten in there, so this is gluten free. Um, but yes, I, I'm old school. Again, natural flavors, you pop these in your water bottle, you know, that'll take care of your electrolyte needs. But what happens if what you've put in your bottle is proving to be inadequate and you start feeling those twinges of a cramp coming on? Carry some extra with you. Great question. This heed has the equivalent of one capsule in every scoop. It has the equivalent of one capsule of Endurolite's capsule or roughly half a tablet of this. The gel has only two minerals, sodium to help with the digestive process and potassium as a natural preservative. So you don't, you don't want to try and fulfill your electrolyte needs with this. Now if you're lucky, like my wife, she weighs a buck nothing. She can get by on like a scoop and a half of this in a water bottle. She's got all of her calories, all of her fluid needs, and all of her electrolyte needs taken care of in one product, done. One and a half scoops is not enough for me in terms of calories or electrolytes. I need to add more, so. Um, the dosing with this is variable. But this, even though it comes in tablet or effervescent, you know, or capsule or effervescent tablet, this is as important a part of your fuel as, as anything you're eating or drinking, so do not neglect this. Either way you use this um, every hour during exercise. Yes, sir? When, when do you recommend starting, um, you know, just during the normal course of training? Like, you know, I have longer training sessions and then short one-hour sessions. Do you recommend, a lot of times I won't use any fuels or any electrolytes. Other times, uh, you know, just depend upon if I'm, I'm doing a really hard run, you know, doing a yeah. seven, eight minute mile for an hour, then, sure. then I, I take in some electrolytes. Yeah, I always take a pre-workout dose. I call it the preemptive strike dose. Mm -hmm. I, always take, I always take a dose before my work. I mean, if I'm going for, you know, an hour spin, I pro you know, and, and it's mellow weather, I won't even worry about it because, you know, I, I just don't need it. In fact, I can probably get by on water only mm -hmm. or a scoop of heat at the most. Um, but I, I do think that if you're going out for a hard workout, one that's, especially one that's in hot weather, or if the workout's prolonged, I always take a dose beforehand. That way I don't have to mess around with it for the first 30 or 60 minutes. And then on the Endurolites, is there, I mean, I've taken up to, uh, last year I raced Kona, mm -hmm. and I was taking eight an hour yep. because the road surface temperature yeah. is 140 degrees. Yeah. There's not a whole lot you can do out there. How, how do you acclimate to that? You can't. No. So you have to, you have to uh, pace yourself in deference to the weather, which means you may have to go a little bit slower. It just can't be business as usual. And I'll, I'll, I'll digress just to a quick little story about that. But uh, to answer your question, on a per capsule basis, the increments of each mineral are not so high that if one is not enough, two won't be overkill. I've seen some electrolyte products that are so sodium heavy, it's like, dang, if you're not 190 pounds or higher, two capsules will just send you into sodium overload. So it is really hard to OD on this. You, you know, when you're super fit and when you're really good about post-workout refilling, which is going to be one of our topics that we'll cover, you will have built up a, a nice 60 to 90 minute buffer of fuel. That's it. That's when, I mean, you drain the glycogen tank, you're running on fumes, and if you can make it for four hours without, you know, tearing down a whole lot of lean muscle tissue, that's a miracle. You've got to, you've got to put some calories back in it. Once you go over 60, 90 minutes, you really do, because that's, that's all the reservoirs your body holds. You've got... Yeah, you got to do some calories. Whether you carry some gel or, you know, heed, anything in the two, three hour range, carbs only, either of these two products are fine. Once you get into three or four hours and beyond, you know, this becomes a more appropriate field because it has carbs and protein and this one has a little bit of fat in there too. Kind of like a meal in a bottle. Yeah, anything over 90 minutes for sure. You've got to put some calories back in or, or you're, you're going to bonk. <laughs> You know, you you just you won't have anything left. So you want to have energy after. Oh. Oh. 
No. And, and, and I'll explain why as we go down. Yes? <laughs> when does your fat reserves kick in at what point? About two hours. But about, about two hours into the workout. That's a training. That can be a training effect, though, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, the more fit you are. See, some people believe that the fitter you become, the more your body is capable of processing calories. That's a fallacy. No matter what you eat, the liver at the most can kick out at the most about 280 to 300 calories an hour at the most. Again, that's going to vary for athletes based on their size. Larger people will have a bigger liver, which means they can process more calories. But as you become fitter, what happens is you, don't, you do not become better adept at processing calories. You become better adept at using your fat stores as energy. That's part of you know, the whole training process is that your body becomes really good at utilizing its fat stores, but it needs some fuel to keep that, those fat burning stores stoked. You know, you've got to have some calories coming in or else your body's going to hold on to those fat stores. No fuel coming in, no energy coming out. Um, um, number nine is really a no-brainer, but I'm guilty of it too. Don't use any new supplement or fuel supplement fueling protocol, don't use anything new in a race. I mean, don't strap on a brand new pair of running shoes and go and run a marathon. It's going to be miserable. Quick story. First year I did Race Across America, also known as RAM. Um, the Time Shoes and Pedal Company, that was when they first came out. And they were giving all the riders, I mean a couple months before the race, they said, we will hook you guys up with three sets of shoes and pedals. And I'm like, right here, I got Visa and MasterCard of my sponsors, you know, and I'm already, I'm already in debt to them. So yeah, I'll take anything free. So I trained with them. I liked them. I used them in the race. I kid you not, the morning of the race, one of the race favorites, I saw his crew unspindling his pedals off of his bike. I saw them breaking out the shoes, the new shoes, right out of the box, screwing in the cleats, and he wore them. I was just like, unbelievable. This guy was a great rider, but the cleat, he just hadn't, you know, adapted to that equipment. And that race that year went from San Francisco to Washington, D.C., so we had to go over the Sierra Nevadas the first night. He went over Carson Pass and just destroyed his knees. Race over, you know, so don't, yeah, I mean, that's just dumb. So is using a supplement program or a new fuel or grabbing something off the aid station table that you're like, I don't know if this is going to work. We'll give it a shot. Uh-uh. Test everything, be it equipment, supplements, fuels. You've got to test it. That being said, um, when you get to the race, you got to be flexible. You know, because what works in training under much more relaxed, less stressful, lo lower intensity conditions may not be appropriate in a race. I mean, you go to Kona, you know, that's like its own, you know, weather system there. You know, what worked in 80 degree temperatures is not going to work in Kona. You know, I go down to Auburn, Alabama, and it's a billion degrees down there. My fueling protocol that worked when I was riding in Whitefish, Montana is not going to work. So, you know, and, and the ultra cyclists are the worst. They're like, come hell or high water, damn it, I'm getting my 280 calories. I don't care if I'm booting everything, I'm just still going to do it. And, and, and so the, the idea is um, have a game plan, test everything in training. You know, bring it to the race so that, you know, you can have some confidence in your fueling program, but don't be a slave to it. Be willing to adapt to it in deference to the weather. Uh, several years ago, uh, I went out to the Spokane 24 hours round the clock mountain bike race. This has nothing to do with fuel, by the way, but it ties in kind of nicely. Um, I was out there, uh, we, we sponsored the race, and Ah, it must have been like for two, two or three weeks before the race. It was in like the 50s. Two days before the race, all of a sudden, boom, it's up in the 80s. And 
I was like dying out there. And I was just standing underneath our Easy Up 10 selling product. And I watched some of the solo guys go out and just click off these insane fast laps. I'm like, dang, don't these guys know that it's really hot? Either they've been training in the heat or they're going to die before we get to noon. And I told a friend, I said, watch, half of the pros are going to drop out before sundown. Half of them dropped out before 3 o'clock because they didn't pace themselves in deference to the weather. Same is true with your fueling. You know, what works in training under much more relaxed and less stressful conditions may not work in a race. So just be flexible with that. Be willing to alter that game plan. Like I say, write, have a game plan, but write it in pencil, not in ink. Okay. Um, number 11 is really, 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 really important. I devote a whole chapter in this book. I would urge you to read it. I'm a big, huge zealot about recovery. I think it's as important a thing as anything you do in the workout. Um, as you become fitter, your body uh, says, you know what? If you're going to put the wood to me tomorrow, I'm going to learn how to be better prepared. So it learns how to store more and more minutes of a real premium fuel called glycogen. It stores it in the muscles. There's an enzyme called glycogen synthase. It is super active in the first 60 to 90 minutes after a workout. This little enzyme, glycogen synthase, is responsible for taking your carbohydrate intake converting it into glycogen and slamming it in the muscles. As you become fitter, your body wants to store more glycogen in the muscles so that it has more onboard, ready to use fuel, more reserves. So how do you maximize glycogen stores? Well, number one, you train. Number two, you put something down your gullet as soon as possible after exercise. You gotta strike while the iron is hot and the iron is hot for the first 30 to 60 minutes, maybe 90 minutes after exercise. So like my old coach used to say, when you're done with your workout, you're not done. Make sure you eat some high quality food or use a recovery drink before you get in the shower, before you get on the sofa and take a nap. Once you do that, once you put some quality food or fuel you know, into your system, then the workout's over. Because in response to the strain that your body, you put on your body in training, your body is saying, look man, uh, you've just emptied me out. I need refilling. I need some carbohydrates to refill the tank. And if you put them in me, I'll actually store a little bit more each and every workout. If you give me some protein, I'll have the raw materials that the body needs for rebuilding the lean muscle tissue. Uh, that's a good time to take some antioxidants as well. You want your immune system going in the toilet? Don't do anything. You want it to get stronger? Take some, some nutritional supplements that have some antioxidants to uh, deal with all the free radicals that you've produced. So as important as anything you did in training, if you want to get the full value out of anything you've done in training, get in the habit of putting some quality food or fuel back into your system within the first 30 to 60 minutes. The late Ed Burke, who wrote the book on recovery, simply said the sooner the better. Glycogen synthase, that enzyme that is responsible for converting glycogen or for converting carbs into glycogen and storing it in the muscles, works with insulin. It is super active in the first 30 to 60 minutes after exercise. That just peters out. There are carbs, protein, and amino, and the amino acid glutamine, which is an antioxidant, but there are no additional antioxidants. We make separate supplemental products for that. Uh, number one, if we did it all in one, it would cost a fortune. Number two, some of those antioxidants in powder form taste awful. And I know because I've tried them all. Um, no, the main thing really is you got to get some carbs back in your system and you got to get some protein. We stuck the glutamine in there for the immune system. And for me, 
after I'm done, you know, just beating myself down with like a hard workout, number one, I'm too tired to make a, a good meal. And number two, my stomach is going, ease up there, boy. You know, you know, take it easy, chief. You know, we need some calories, but we need them in a very easy, digestible form. That's half the reason this product exists. I mean, a few scoops in water or one of these cool little, little blender bottles, cold water, drink it down, boom, you're done. You've just put the best finishing touches on your workout. You've prepped your body better than you possibly could any other way for your next workout, and your body rewards you. The lean muscle tissue grows stronger. It doesn't stay in a state of disrepair. Your immune system gets stronger. It doesn't go, you know, swirling down. Um, your body stores more and more minutes of glycogen in the muscles. And the, as you hit your peak fitness, and the more consistent you are with immediate post-workout refueling, your body can store anywhere from 60 to 90 minutes of glycogen in the muscles. Muscle glycogen is the first fuel your body is going to use when you begin a workout or a race. Sadly, we can't store unlimited amounts of it. The maximum is about 90 minutes. Um, but that's really a nice advantage when you start a race with a 90 minute reservoir of fuel that is the first fuel your body's going to use. So how do you maximize glycogen stores? You train, you eat. And you eat, whether it's a recovery drink or high quality solid food, as soon as possible after exercise. Do that and that will be the single most important thing you can do to enhance the quality of your workouts and obtain better race results. It is by far the simplest thing you can do, but it will have the most immediately noticeable effects on your training. I guarantee you. Make recovery as important as anything you do in training and watch how your body responds. It'll just blow you away. Question? Uh, how many carbohydrates should I worry about taking in? Can I take too many after my workout? Um, it, there is, yeah, you can. You can, and, and that's been a subject of debate for a long time. Um, if you've ever read the works of Dr. Michael Colgan of New Zealand, he has a great book. It's a little outdated now, but some of the information is still real pertinent. Um, he suggests X amount of carbs based on the length of the workout and body weight. Um, this has 30 grams of carbs and 10 grams of protein. I think for most people that's a pretty good start knowing that you're going to sit down for a regular meal in about an hour. Now there have been some workouts that I've done where, excuse me, solid food has been out of the question for a couple hours or if I've just done something just insanely difficult, I'll make a six scoop bottle of this. You know, now I'll have 90 grams of carbs and, and 30 grams of protein, three to one ratio. It and I'll just nurse on that for a while you know, for an hour or so. But yeah, there is, a, there is an amount of carbohydrates, but I think within the first uh, two to three hours, more than, more than 100 grams of carbs and 30 or 40 grams of protein is probably overkill. Your body will tend to store it as body fat instead of in the, in the muscles. But again, uh, it really, how much of this you use is dependent on the length of the workout and the severity and when your next sit down meal is going to be. So you just time, you, you base it on that. Um, I will just make one suggestion with this. We put a lot of glutamine in here. Two scoops has 3,000 milligrams of glutamine. Again, it's not a terribly stable amino acid, so when you use this product, don't mix it ahead of time because the longer glutamine stays in solution, the, the more it tends to degrade. So if you're doing a workout, you know, just make it, just you know, carry the, the bag with you in the blender ball or put a couple scoops in the bottle and then add water when you're done with your workout. You had a question. Yeah, I had a question on number 11, just to clarify. For the average person that's perhaps just going to the gym doing something like the elliptical or whatnot for 30 to 60 minutes, number 11 would still hold true. Sure. So it's not just for endurance athletes sure. and hardcore. Yeah, you, you, you're, you're going through your glycogen stores, you're emptying out the tank. Probably not as much as some guy who just did an hour worth of hill repeats, mm -hmm. but you've done something. So have a banana. You know, if you don't feel like that, have, have a scoop of this. Do something. 
Because it's nine o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Why not? <laughs> You got to refill the you got to refill the tank a little bit, or else your body is always going to be in the red. Going, you know, I was ready to store more glycogen for you, but you gave me nothing, so I've got nothing to work with. So even if it's just a banana, you know, after a 30-minute workout, that's fine. Or a scoop of this. I mean, two scoops is only 170 calories, so it's not like this, you know, weight gainer thing. So <laughs> you don't need to worry about that. But yeah. Even after a very short workout, you've, you've, you've drained some of your stores, so you need to put them back in. Okay. It's really important. I mean, be consistent about that and watch how incredible your body will respond. It's, it's just remarkable. Um, number 12, the triathletes always hate me when I talk about this. Actually, all the athletes do. Don't overconsume food the night before the race in the hopes of carbo loading. It's kind of like training. You know what? If you're not fit the week before a race, there ain't nothing you can do the week before the race that it's going to get you any fitter. Same is true with carbo loading. You know, if you haven't built up those glycogen stores, there's not a whole lot you can do the week before the race. Definitely nothing you can do the night before the race. The enzyme that controls glycogen synthesis and storage, that enzyme glycogen synthase, it's only active during a short period of time after a workout. Now in the days leading up to a race, you better not be working out. You better just be easy spin, you know, or just, you know, a couple of laps in the pool. It's rest time. The hay better be in the barn. And I just, it, it just really bothers me when I, I see, I, I'll go up to Ironman Canada and guarantee, has anyone ever been up there? It's beautiful up there, but there's a nasty little hill called Richter Pass, and that's way out in, as the Aussies would say, it's way out in Whoop Whoop. I mean, it's a it's long way away from town. And two days before the race, there are guys just drilling it up this hill. And it's like, you're burning all your matches. The race day is in two days. You know, they're going through what we call taper tantrum. You know, God, I'm going to lose all my fitness. No, you're not. You know, it's better to be well rested before a race than it is to be like razor sharp and have only one way to go and down. So the same is true with carbo loading. I don't believe in that term. Carbo loading, in my opinion, is not what you do the week before the race and definitely not the night before the race. Carbo loading is what you do when glycogen synthase is really active and that's in the first 30 to 60 minutes after all of your workouts in the weeks and months leading up to the race. You want to know what true carbo loading is? That's what it is. So don't, you know, it's tempting to think, you know what, I'm going back for thirds and fourths and fifths at that pasta feed and I'm going to be carbo loading. You know what, that enzyme that stores glycogen is on sleep mode. Why? Because you haven't, you haven't done a glycogen depletion workout. It's, it's on sleep mode, and all those excess calories are either going to be excreted out the other end or they're going to be stored as body fat, dead weight. So my rule with um, uh, the night before the race is eat clean, you know, clean water, save the alcohol for afterwards, you know, eat, eat lean, you know, what pro a source of protein, whatever your choice, fish, chicken, meat. You know, have some good quality complex carbohydrates. You know, skip the dessert. All that stuff's going to taste way better after the race anyway. Eat a good quality meal. Eat until you're satisfied. Call it a night. There's nothing you can do the days before the race or the night before the race that's going to positively influence how your body stores fuel. We're not camels. It's going nowhere except in your fat stores. So... Enough about that. Um, number 13. <laughs> this is the most controversial topic I've ever written about, and it, it, it'll sound a little, excuse me, counterintuitive, but, but hear me out, because in 11 years, 11 and a half years of working with athletes, every single one of them, and I'm talking about a couple thousand athletes, every one of them who has applied this principle that has bothered to call or email has said, you know what, this damn thing works like a charm. Every single, I'm batting a thousand after 11 and a half years, not one person has said this doesn't work. There's a whole chapter in this book 
about this and explains it to a T. For races and workouts over 60 minutes in length, if you're going to eat anything, you got to finish it three hours prior to the start. Why? Because when you eat something, it elevates your insulin, which causes your body to, if you start exercising, it will accelerate the rate at which you burn your body's glycogen stores. Now, I mean, it took you months of hard training and gallons of recovery to build up that 60 to 90 minutes of muscle glycogen. That's the first fuel your body is going to use when you begin a workout or a race. If you eat too close to the start, say an hour or two, you accelerate the rate at which your body burns through its glycogen. Simply by timing your pre-exercise meal wrong, you can devastate, devastate what took you several weeks and lots of recovery to accrue. So it takes about three hours for insulin and all of its hormonal influences to go back down to baseline. That's exactly where you want them when you start the workout or race. Now if the race is 60 minutes or less, yeah, sure, have a little something. Sip on some heed leading up to the start. Yeah, your insulin will be jacked up. Your, your glycogen will be b burning at f maximum rates. So what? By the time you empty them out, race is over. But anything longer than that, you want your body to conserve its glycogen stores. So how do you do that? Number one, if you're going to eat, you got to finish it three hours prior so that you allow insulin and all of its influences to go back down to baseline. So that leads to number, and, and I'll just say this, this is an acquired skill because we are all used to, th especially in an early morning workout, we're all used to getting up and thinking, you know what, I got to be on empty. I've been sleeping the whole night. My stomach's growling. That must mean I have no, no gas in the tank. Um, which leads to number 14. Don't sacrifice sleep to eat a pre-exercise meal. If you go to bed with, say, 60 minutes of glycogen stored in the muscles, that's exactly what you're going to wake up with. You haven't drained one calorie, not one gram of that. Now, your brain may be going, I'm hungry, feed me, and your stomach's growling, but your muscles are like, we're good to go. Let's do this thing. So when I get up for an early morning workout, I don't bother eating anything, even though you would think, dang, my body's got to be on empty. It's not. The first fuel you're going to use when that workout or race begins is stored in the muscles. And what you go to bed with is exactly what you're going to wake up with. So again, your stomach may be growling and your brain may be complaining, and you may be in a foul mood because you're hungry, but your muscles are like, we're good to go. And as long as you don't wait too long to start the refueling process, your body will respond wonderfully. The person who eats one to two hours or so prior to the start of a workout that's longer than 60 to 90 minutes will basically bonk faster than someone who fasted three hours or just simply didn't eat anything and began refueling shortly after the workout began. So some people say, now, my race starts at 6 in the morning. Does that mean i got to get up at 2 o'clock and eat? And the answer is no. You can if you want, but you really don't need to because, again, what you go to bed with is exactly what you're going to wake up with. Now, what's been keeping your metabolism going throughout the night is the glycogen stored in your liver. Totally different thing. Muscle glycogen, still there, full amount. Liver glycogen, that's going to be a little on the low side. And it's not a bad idea to consume a little something something to top off your liver glycogen stores if only because it'll put you in a better mood. But you don't want to do that at a time that's going to negatively affect how your body's burning its muscle glycogen stores. So here's the rule with any workout that's longer than 60 minutes, 90 minutes at tops. I, I'm conservative. I say 60 minutes is, is my, my, my top, you know, that's, that's where I, my cutoff line. Anything longer than that, I'm either finishing a pre-exercise meal three hours prior, or I'm beginning my workout on an empty stomach, or, like I tell the triathletes, and this is a really good idea for triathletes, 
they can't fuel during the swim. So what do they do? Well, I don't want them to get up early and sacrifice sleep and all of its recuperative benefits. So I tell them, slam a hammer gel. Or if you've made a, a concentrated bottle of heat for the bike and you've racked it, just take a swig off of that about five or eight minutes prior to the start. By the time those calories are ingested and your blood sugar levels are elevated, you're already well into the swim. And you'll have topped off your liver glycogen stores, but you won't have ne negatively affected your muscle glycogen stores. So again, the key with pre-exercise fueling for anything over 60 minutes in length, you either finish a pre-workout exercise, race meal, three hours prior. If that's not logistically feasible, and it's never logistically feasible to get up early to eat, I just love sleep too much. Have a little something five minutes or so prior to the start, or just start the workout on an empty stomach. I mean, if you're riding your bike, get and you get up in the morning, have your coffee, don't put any calories in it, get on your bike, for me, it's about 20 minutes before I start feeling comfortable and my body says, okay, let's take on some calories ready to go. Boom. Now I'm conserving my glycogen stores and I'm using them very efficiently. And the last topic is if you are going to eat a pre-exercise meal, you don't need the thousand calorie mega meal like some coaches say. Again, just like the night before a race, your body's not going to know what to do with all these, you know, this 2000 calorie mega meal. You're either going to have it still in your digestive system floating around while the race begins, you're going to be in a porta potty for an hour before the race begins, or you're going to be wishing you were about a half hour after the race begins. Now, liver glycogen, which is what's been keeping your metabolism going through the night, will be low in the morning. That's all right. Top it off, you only need two to 400 calories. That's it. You don't need a, a, a big old meal. So again, number 13, 14, and 15 sounds a little counterintuitive. It sounds a little crazy. Most people who, who I recommend doing that to, and it is an acquired skill, but try it, practice it, and watch how your body responds. You will have more endurance, I guarantee it. I've been doing this for 11 and a half years with athletes. I've tested it more times on myself than I care to imagine and I, I care to remember. There's a whole article on this. Proper fueling, pre-workout and race suggestions. There is a ton of science behind it. So even though it doesn't sound correct up here, physiologically speaking, it makes perfect sense. So give it a try. So those two things. You know, the pre-exercise meal, what you do and when, and post-workout recovery, staying away from the simple sugars. You do that and you will see some huge quantum leaps in the quality of your workouts. And again, 15 simple things that you can do. You got nothing to lose by trying them. You know, adjust them for your own personal physiology. Boom, now you've made fueling your, your ally you know, it's not a weakness like it is for so many athletes. It's your ally now. It's your strong point. So, question. How long can you go after you do your exercise in the diet? I mean, you eat first, then, then you do your exercise. And then after you do your exercise, how long can you go before you have to did you have to eat right away? After exercise, the sooner the better. And the reason, again, is because there's an enzyme in the body that controls and works with insulin in taking your food intake, converting it into this stuff called glycogen, and putting it in the muscles. As you become fitter, and the more consistent you are with as soon as possible after exercise, Refueling, your body rewards you by storing more and more minutes of, of fuel in the muscles. And I can tell you, I would much rather start the, you know, get on the starting line with a 90 minute reservoir of this premium, first used when exercise begins fuel. I'd rather have a 90 minute reservoir of that. And it's so easy to do. You train and you eat as soon as possible after exercise, ideally within the first 30 to 60 minutes. That's all you have to do. You do that and you will have a massive advantage over someone who's just 
blown it off. That's why I'm so zealous about it. It's because it's so darn easy to do. But the payoff is just amazing. You know, so yeah, get in the habit of post-workout refueling. Even after your short workouts, heck, a banana's, you know, 80 to 100 calories. You don't have to worry about the calorie part of it. That's what I was actually going to ask you. What if you're like the average person, you kind of blew your whole calorie count for the day earlier in the day. You're way over your calories. Still eat that banana. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do it and then start making some changes in your other dietary intake. Mm -hmm. Understanding that dieting and training, real hard training, do not work well. Because the body's going to lose water first, muscle second, and fat third. So for me, I do try to eat clean. I try to watch what I eat. I try to limit, you know, um, my, my vice, which is red wine. Um, <laughs> um, but now that I'm no longer competing, I don't really, no, I'm sure. <laughs> We're just checking you. Yeah, I'm, no, I'm a, I'm a big, I, I collect red wine and I love it. So um, now that I'm no longer competing, I'm not really worried about that as much. Uh, but I still try to eat healthy. Um, and again, the real, the real key, I think, is that, that old adage, eat like a king at breakfast, a, a, a prince at lunch, and a pauper at dinner. Just the one, and so sometimes my I'm over my 1,400 calories for the day, and I'm you know hitting 16, 17. So that's okay. I eat that banana, and I start thinking, well, nah. maybe I burned three to 500 calories in well, my workout, but <laughs> it's my understanding that the best way to diet is not to follow the same amount of calories every day. And I do do you do that. If you, if you eat 1,800 calories a day, your body becomes very efficient at burning 1,800 calories a day no matter what you do. So I'm not an expert on dieting, but what you do is you take some, you go a little bit higher on some days and a little bit lower, and that confuses your body's thermostat. So. I have a registered dietitian, and I definitely agree with what you're saying. And also, your benefits of eating your banana are going to far outweigh yes. that couple hundred calories. Well put. So don't, I mean, you can't be a robot. Don't get paranoid and, about it. No, not at all. And like I was saying, you know, that's the easiest way to get your glycogen stores high. And so the benefit is going to Far, far, far out. And, and wouldn't you agree that we're, we're really designed, the body is designed to graze and have several, Definitely. you know, so it's not really, you know, three hots and a tie and a cot, you know. You eat, you're actually burning calories right. because of the thermic effect of food. So, you know, you should be motivated to eat throughout the day. Yeah. <laughs> Small amount. We're, we're meant to be, we're meant to be grazers. Now, my big problem is I don't usually eat breakfast. I eat lunch, and uh, the next thing I know, unless I have some chromium to balance the blood sugar, I'm like ready f to sleep underneath my desk. But I'll go home and I'll have a massive dinner. Now, when I was training 30 something hours a week, I could get away with that. I can't now. So, you know, I have to shift, you know, that whole, you know, eating pattern. So. I was wondering with your whole, um, the theory of, and I understand that you have your glycogen stores and the liver and the muscle and that type of stuff. So, but for a deconditioned individual to not eat before exercise, when you've been doing your research and stuff, have you ran into anything regarding that? Um, no, but I think that it still applies. But you do, uh, again, because when you eat too close to the start, whatever glycogen you have is going to be burned at a much more accelerated rate. So, yeah, you, you, you definitely, it still applies even if you don't have a conditioned athlete. They, they will do better if they fast for three hours prior to the start of the exercise session, or if they're doing, if they're just jonesing for something, Eating five to eight minutes prior to the start is a lot better than, you know, one to two hours. Or just starting on an empty stomach. Now, we're talking about workouts that are longer than 60 minutes. Mm -hmm. So anything other than that, that rule doesn't apply. So, and that's what I, yeah. where I was getting confused because I have these individuals that, you know, convert, I don't know. So anyways, I would just... No, then the rule doesn't apply. Why? Because 
Who cares if you're burning your glycogen stores at max rates? If you've got 90 minutes on board and you're doing a sprint triathlon that takes you an hour or so, why not ride that insulin freight train from beginning to end and just ride that tidal wave of glycogen? Who cares if you empty it out? By the time you're done, you're, you're into your post-workout beer or whatever. So, Edward. One more question along those lines that she was just talking about. For someone that's only been working out maybe a half hour to an hour a day last year, maybe five days a week, and has not been refueling mm. right after they ate, uh, I obviously have not been, you have less than 60 to 90 minutes then of glycogen stores yes. at this point. Yep. Okay. Your body is saying, hey, I'm ready to, I'm ready to store more, but you gotta provide, you got to provide the fuel. Okay. I think that's the biggest mistake I've seen. In Huge mistake on my part, yeah. <laughs> You know, and you'll probably, you're going to probably notice a lot better. Yeah, you're going to see some major differences. And even though this product would is, is arguably more than you need, I mean, the protein can't hurt. The carbs are of high quality. And you've got that glutamine for the immune system and gastrointestinal system. And glutamine is involved in the production of what I think is the strongest antioxidant we have, which is glutathione. I mean, even that wouldn't be, you know, a scoop of that is 85 calories, you know, two scoops, 170. I mean, that's, that's a, you know, it's not, you know, as exciting as a cheeseburger or something, but it's a lot better for you. But yeah, you know, she's exactly right. You know, athletes who neglect the recovery part of their training don't get the full value out of it. And they are missing out on a huge advantage, whether you're racing or not. I mean, when you take the time to put some fuel back in your body, that allows your body to, you can gradually increase the volume and intensity of your training without your muscular system or your immune system taking such a beating. You know, it's just like training. If you train, if you train long and slow, and that's all you do, you get very good at being long and slow. But if you train with you know different types of training methods, you become a much better rounded athlete. So it's kind of maybe not the right analogy to use, but I think that if you if you incorporate proper recovery techniques, which is ideally just pri primarily rather refilling the tank after your workouts, that will be the single most important thing that you can do to ramp up the quality of your training increase its volume and intensity, but without putting your immune system or, or your muscular system, uh, you know, in, in, at risk. Yeah, I think I can see where it definitely has its applications. It explains why I burn out probably about a half hour into a workout with my personal trainer. Yeah. So I just haven't been refueling. So yeah, thank you. Uh, mentioning lactic acid, is there any way that you can dissipate lactic acid? Is there anything mm. you can do post-exercise that would help? Massage is probably the best way. Um, uh, there's a few nutrients that help. One of them is a nutrient called carnosine, which is a dipeptide. It, it, or a, is it a dipeptide? Yeah, it's a dipeptide. It's, it's a combination of two amino acids. It, it doesn't help so much with the clearing of lactic acid, but it does help neutralize and scavenge excess amounts of it. Um, so that is in recovery right? and that helps too, but massage is probably the best way uh, to clear out the metabolic waste byproducts that you've accumulated that, um, you know, the, the whole thing, the shower, the bath, the stretching, that, that's about your best bet. Um, so. Well, I just wondered if there's any, anything, any supplement you could take. Well, we, we make a product and the, the, the best Acid buffering, pH neutralizing nutrient I know of is sodium phosphate. It is best used, and we make a product called Race Day Boost. That's basically nothing but sodium phosphate. It is best used in a four-day loading dose format prior to key races. It is not something you want to use a lot of on a constant basis. Yes. The reason is, is because you need a thousand milligrams four times a day for four days to do the proper loading dose. Now every thousand milligrams of sodium phosphate contains almost 200 milligrams of sodium as part of the molecule, as part of the compound. 
So every thousand milligrams, which you're taking four times a day, you know, 20% of that or 200 milligrams is sodium. So you're adding 800 milligrams of your, to your daily intake of sodium. Number two, excess amounts of phosphate is believed to interfere with calcium absorption. And let's not go there. You know, we want to absorb our calcium. So it is, it is a very well studied, Richard Kreider is a very well respected uh, researcher. He wrote the book on sodium phosphate loading and it works like a charm, but it's best used um, infrequently. We do put a small dose in here, but if you're doing a key race and want to load up with that product, it's best done that way in a loading dose format. And that's the best acid buffering pH nutrient. I know of the other one is, is uh, an amino acid combination called carnosine. It has much better properties in that it's, but one of its nice side effects, so to speak, is that it just happens to be a good acid buffering agent. It's really a, a very powerful antioxidant um, and anti-glycation uh, that has properties for longevity, potentially longevity. So, <clears throat> so that also helps with recovery then? You betcha. We put some carnosine in here uh, number one, it, it has antioxidant properties. Um, as we age, our body's uh, circulating sugars and proteins tend to collide or join and, and create non-functioning structures called anti-glycation end products, which is believed to be, or ages, which is believed to be one of the theories of of a variety of diseases. The most, the most popular and most accepted theory of aging is the free radical theory of aging, but the glycation uh, theory of aging is also gaining a lot of steam. And the best nutrient that helps prevent this normal bodily reaction that occurs when we age uh, called glycation is this uh, amino acid called carnosine. And we put, we put that in a few of our products. Number one, it, it has, you know, it's it's in heat as well. It's in perpetuum. It's in sustained energy. Um, you know, there's a lot of debate on how much is enough. Um, it's non-toxic. So, but but um, we, you know, it, it is fairly costly. So to keep the cost down, uh, there's not a ton of it in there. But it's a pretty dynamic nutrient. Uh, I take extra carnosine on a daily basis. Well, I would imagine pilgrims would have it. Yeah, I would think so, yes. On, on the perpetual, uh, for iron distance races, I, uh, I normally get up three hours before, mix two scoops and drink it. Uh, is there any real advantage to that based upon what you were saying sure. before? Sure. You've just topped off your liver glycogen stores. Your body's going, thank you very much. All systems go. It's a great pre-race meal. Okay. Yeah. Oh, it's perfect. And what more do you need? You got carbs, protein, and fat, no fiber. Just as long as I'm going three hours before. Yeah, you got to finish it three hours before or darn right. close as, to that as possible. Okay. And then you mentioned uh, after longer races, you know, so, so I'm out there 12 to 14 hours, depending upon the race, uh, you know, on the recover right. Now, what I normally have done is I have two mixer bottles, one with two scoops in it and that I drink right away as soon as I can get to it okay. afterwards, and then another one about an hour later. Can I double up on that? I would. Pro you know what I would do after a full Ironman? I'd make a four or six scoop bottle and just nurse that thing for an hour or so. Okay. I mean, get it's, it's not going to be overkill on the calories. And it really depends on when your body is like, okay, I'm ready to take on solid food. So I would, I would certainly just, you know, take a four or six scoop bottle after the race and just nurse that for an hour or so. I think that would just, logistically, it would be easier. What about uh, products out there? Uh, I have a friend of mine that swears by using a product called Sport Legs. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if you have a product like that or anything, but... I try to make it a habit not to discuss other companies' products by name. Okay. Um, 
I will if we can keep it in this room. Because the, sadly, society in general, but especially the supplement industry has become very litigious. And we've had a few. <laughs> you know, we love to critique products. I'd, I'd love to tell you what stuff's great and what stuff's not. But I'm kind of I'm kind of bound. Okay. Um, I will say this about sports legs: it's a damn good calcium magnesium supplement. But to me, that's all it is, because it's calcium and magnesium bonded to lactic acid, lactate. Their idea is that if you take lactic acid ahead of time, it will tell the body not to produce as much. I'm not really sure if I buy that. That would be like saying, I'm going to crack open one of those CO2 cartridges, suck in the carbon dioxide, and because I've already introduced it to my body, I'm going to breathe out less carbon dioxide. That's kind of the, the analogy. So, you don't. So, you, you do believe that if you take in lactic acid ahead of time, it's going to tell the body not to produce as much? No, I'm not agreeing with that either. CO2. Well, that's that's <laughs> that that's that's the closest thing I can get to to an analogy. If I could think of a better one, I would certainly I would certainly bring it in. Um, well, that's not the point. The point is that um, you know does it does it do what it says it does? Um, I think it's a great calcium magnesium supplement, and I think those two, in my idea, in my opinion, those are the two most important minerals for m proper muscular contraction. Does it buffer lactic acid? I don't know. I've never tried it. So I can't tell you from personal experience, but I'm not sure I, I'm, I'm fully on board with the claims. Okay. So, but if, so, if, someone, if someone thinks it works, far be it from me to say no. I mean, even well, I the... so many products out there, it's it's as much perception as reality well, sure. as opposed to sure. what it's really doing for you. And when you look at our, I mean, we make 20 products. You know, we, we make 20 products and capsules and stuff. So um, in this book, I thought, yeah, people are going to just go crazy, you know, looking at all these supplements and all the things we're talking about. I'm going to say, I need everything on the list. So what I did is I said, well, out of all our products, I gave certain ones hierarchy. I called them daily essentials, meaning out of all the products we make, these are three products that I believe have the most benefits for general health and overall, or overall health and, and, and athletic performance. Plenty of crossover benefits. And then I've broken them down to, okay, if you really want to go to the next level of your supplement program, if the budget allows, this would be on my next is most important list. And then further on down the line. I've prioritized them to kind of make it easier. Now, we have a product called Tissue Rejuvenator. And if someone's got a joint problem or is rehabilitating a, you know, an ACL tear, that bad boy is number one on their list. It's not number one on mine because I don't have any joint injuries. Have you had any results with that? Oh, yeah. What about cartilage? Does that help with cartilage? Absolutely. The problem that people have with glucosamine and chondroitin products is they don't give them a fair enough shot. It takes, I would suggest, six to eight weeks. Is that what that product is? It, it has that and a few other things in there. Um, some natural anti-inflammatories. But most people that have issues with joint health products don't use enough of the product, they don't use it consistently, and they aren't using it long enough. Remember. Well, of course, of course, you have to buy from a reputable company. I took that. I used to play a lot of racquetball. That's really a bad. You know, once you have joint problems, a, a joint health product, primarily containing glucosamine, chondroitin, and probably MSM would be high on the list. Um, those three things, you got to stay on them because you don't start seeing effects for several weeks because you're not covering the problem with a Band-Aid. You're getting to the root of the problem and giving the body the raw materials it needs to do re its reparation processes. So you need to give a product like that a fair shake, give it, do it consistently, and stay on it because the effects are cumulative, the benefits are cumulative, so. Yeah, there was a 
we have time for one more question uh, or two more questions. Well, grab one of my cards, and if you remember it, email it to me. <laughs> By the way, I there's a lot of information that we share tonight. There's a lot of information in the book. Um, again, I don't like to make product comparisons. It's just it's just not it's just not my. You know, if someone finds something that works for them, great. I'm not going to tell them not to take it. I really like our products, you know, but like I said at the very beginning, we're all experiments of one. You got to try a variety of things to find what works for you. To be honest with you, most of, most of the products that you get, like vitamin C, I would say close to 90%, if not all of them, come from one major manufacturer. Most of the B vitamins in this country come from one major manufacturer. Most of the coenzyme Q10, which we put in one of our products, um, if I'm not mistaken, most of that comes from Japan. They have kind of a cartel on it. Most of the L-carnitine that you get, uh, most of that comes from Italy. So, you know, as long as you're buying from a reputable manufacturer. But anyway, the point I was making is there's a lot of information brought out tonight, um, you know, there won't be a test an hour later, um, but do take my card. If you have questions about anything that we've gone over, if you remember the question you have, that's what I do. I like to help athletes, um, you know, take the guesswork out of fueling and, and help them with their supplement program so they can get the most out of their training. So, yes? In that book, the book that we have, is there mention about that carnosine stuff? Um, yeah, it's in there somewhere. And what about that other joint stuff? Yeah, yeah it's in this, it's in this book, yeah. Okay, last um, question, go ahead. There are uh, long back breaks, like 40, like uh, ratings, one to possibly eat within that time. After? But what I'm saying is when you take a long back break, it's like 40, five hours, do you... During the ride? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. And this is the product that I use the most. Okay. I'll give you I'll just give you one quick thing. When I do a six hour bike ride, I will make a four hour bottle of Perpetuum and I will carry a flask of hammer gel. Yeah. Boom. I've got six hours of fuel in one bottle and one little flask. The only thing I need to do along the way is get more water. I've just made things super easy on myself. Um, in the book, I forget which book it is, we talk about, and we talk about it on the container itself. You know, you can make a one hour bottle. You can make a multi hour bottle. In fact, when I did the double 508, I thought, you know, as long as I'm getting in the right amount of calories, who cares how thick or thin it is? So I busted out the blender because I knew I was going to be out there for 70 something hours. And I thought, there's no way I can drink a bottle of flavored swill every hour. This is not going to happen. So I broke out a blender and I made what I call perpetuum paste. It's like pancake batter. And I could make three hours in one little flask, which meant I just had to take a little nip of that and augment that with plain water. So we, we talk about making you know, a gel or a paste-like consistency. So there's no right or wrong way of doing it. The key is getting in the right amount of calories for you. So. It works exceptionally well. Yeah, it's a good product. It's a good product. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming. I hope you enjoy the free goodies. And um, really appreciate your time. <laughs>